and specifically if something isn't clear. And, you know, they say um, miracles don't happen in life. And actually, for a, a small number of people in oncology, miracles do happen. And they're called spontaneous regressions of metastatic disease. Uh, they're more common in certain disease types, so melanoma, for example, but they're extremely rare. And what we know is happening here is those lucky few patients are able to somehow have the interaction of their immune system with this tumor go through some kind of change whereby the immune system is now able to eliminate uh, the tumor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that better like that? Maybe I'll, I'll take that off and just say, is that okay like that? Yeah, okay. So if you like my gestures, I'll, I'll put it up higher. How's that? Is that a bit better up there? Okay, correct. No problem. But you got the early comments. Did you get the introduction there? Okay. And of course, what we do know is, in particular in oncology, across the different types of cancer, there's tremendous variability in patient outcomes. And this is fascinating. And, and what we do in disease modeling is we try to understand the biological determinants of variability of outcome with respect to response to drugs. And when we think about what we do with a drug, we give patients typically multiple drugs. And what we're doing is we're initially, quite rapidly, perturbing the molecular function of particular uh, molecules across various sites in the body. But of course, the next thing we're doing is we're then driving changes through the networks in which these particular molecular players function. And in fact, the ultimate clinical response that we observe, the things we can measure in terms of patient outcomes, are probably largely driven by these downstream effects. They're hard to predict. They take time to develop. And what we've been doing, as I mentioned, is trying to understand the, the spectrum of response, um, particularly within the context of oncology, with a focus on immunotherapies. And again, what we know is if we give a patient population the same combination of drugs, you get very different outcomes. And of course, part of that variability is their disease is fundamentally different at the molecular level. Uh, also, if you give two people exactly the same drug, the blood level, the tumor level of that drug will be very, very different between patients. So that's, of course, another very uh, driver of variability in response. Of course, the actual molecular targets of these drugs might be different just due to genetic diversity. So the drug might bind with much higher affinity to one target in one patient than in another. But we think a lot of the variability is just driven by the downstream aspects. So what's happening within the system? And of course, um, it's fascinating, this whole question of spectrum of response. But it's absolutely devastating if you're on the wrong end, because that can mean the difference of months to years of living. And this is my brother. Um, this is about three years ago. Uh, he had multiple lines of treatment. Nothing touched his disease. It just progressed aggressively, and he was gone within months of diagnosis. Yet there are other patients that are lucky enough to be treated and have years of life. And one of the exciting areas now is immunotherapy. So. You know, we all wished we, for a miracle for, for my brother Philip, it didn't happen. So what can we say about these lucky patients? Well, somehow we know some aspect of their immune system is helping. And this is the so-called cancer immunity cycle, which was put forward by Chen and Melman, 2013. And what it is, it, it tries to summarize kind of key events and the interaction between a patient's immune system and their growing tumor burden. And it tries to characterize what essentially happens in patients that are lucky enough, personally, to have these miraculous cures. But what we're trying to do is pharmacologically push the patient's immune system into a state where it can actually attack the tumor. So we want to fight fire with fire. We want to take immune cells, which are highly specific elements of the adaptive immune system, and have them target tumor cells. We know this can work from the spontaneous regressions. We also now, there's some amazing trials. Malignant melanoma seems to be a death sentence, particularly for young patients. I'm from Australia. We have an epidemic of malignant melanoma. And you were lucky if you could live for six months from under the diagnosis of advanced melanoma. Now, in a small number of patients, admittedly it's still a small fraction of patients, 
um, we're getting deep, durable responses. That means 10 years later, these people are still alive. Think about that. You're young. You're 25. You've been living a great life. All of a sudden, you get this devastating diagnosis. Now you've got 10 more years of life. And for many of these patients, we don't know. They might die of something else. But what's really interesting in some of these patients, they're not disease-free. They've got measurable disease burden. So what you've done, these patients are now somehow just keeping that fire down gently, burning gently. So that interaction with the immune system. And so let's try and understand a little bit more about the steps. And does everybody have some basic uh, knowledge around immunology, or do you want me to kind of... Okay, so, so the basic idea is we're really interested in these things called cytotoxic or CD8 T cells. And these are cells that can seek out and destroy other cells. So that's the one half of the fire. Um, but to do that, there's a number of things um, they have to do. Firstly, the tumor has to be presenting what we call antigen. So these are um, typically proteins. And these are proteins that ideally are specifically expressed by the tumor. Those antigens then have to be grabbed by some other cells that are called antigen-presenting cells, typically dendritic cells, but macrophages as well. Um, and then those dendritic cells need to move to uh, lymph tissue, typically lymph nodes, and they present this antigen. And a very rare T cell, so typically if, if your immune system has never seen this antigen before, maybe about one in a million of your T cells in, in your body circulating will recognize that particular antigen. What happens is these two cells have to find each other, kiss each other, that happens within the secondary lymphoid tissue. And what that does is that drives the proliferation of that rare cell into a larger population. That population then has to go and fight the war. So it has to march through the body, find the tumor sites, and thereby engage. So these are the basic steps. Um, you need to have some antigens generated. Uh, you may already have some antigens, so these are these peptides. Dendritic cells have to grab them, this is step two. Migrate to lymph nodes, step three, where they present them to T cells and they're able to activate and prime, that is, generate an army of these T cells that then march to tumor locations. And those tumor locations, they mediate lysis through immune-based mechanisms. They inject things like perforin, granzyme, they do other things. And this is basically the basis of killing. So they're not prolific serial killers. So once they get into the tumor bed, they live for about two days. If you're lucky, they'll kill about six or so uh, tumor cells in their lifetime, typically up to about 10. Kill rate is typically one tumor cell is killed about every six hours. So when you think about that, you've got to mount an enormous army on a sustained basis, because by the time you're talking about advanced disease, you're talking about just countless tumor cells that are turning over and drying at tremendous rates. So somehow you have to mount an army and sustain the, the, the breeding of soldiers, if you like, to go out and fight the war. So this is the second, uh, the activation, the marching of the army, and so on. And one area that, that really hasn't had much success is that the whole idea of cancer vaccination. And you've all had vaccines. It's an injection to clean your shoulder of various components. And of course, the, the idea of the cancer vaccines is you want to basically help the patient's immune system. What you're saying is some of the steps in that cycle are rate limiting for that patient, and they're rate limiting for them to have that miracle. So what you're trying to do is pharmacologically push them through this first step, presenting antigen, so you inject antigen. You actually inject some elements to help activate the dendritic cells that are actually in the injection site, the vaccination site. And you also inject things to give them their marching orders to activate them so they'll actually go to the lymph node. And we'll have a good chance of hopefully uh, activating the appropriate T-cell population, which will then drive tumor elimination. But the vaccines have been uh, terrible in terms of their overall success rate. And there's one class of, of uh, vaccines where the strategy is to inject fairly short peptides, typically about 9, 10 amino acids. And these peptides are designed to bind specifically to MHC class 1 on dendritic cells. And you can say, well, if, if in general vaccines have had a terrible history, why, why do you think anything can be different? And the, the kind of the school of thought was, actually, we've learned a lot more about the biology. Maybe we weren't injecting the right antigen. 
So let's let's find some techniques for finding some better peptides. And maybe we needed to inject some other things to kind of help things happen uh, along the way. But the real goal, of course, is to induce T cell responses that will drive tumor elimination. And this is by immune-based killing of tumor cells that express one or more of the associated peptides, the antigens. We call them TUMAPs. And like I mentioned, we inject them locally uh, with other therapeutic agents. There's one example, for example, is uh, the um, IMA901, which is a vaccine for renal cell carcinoma. Here they administer nine separate peptides specific for a particular HLA, along with some other agents locally and systemic agents to help their immune system. And one of the approaches, of course, and, and this is the key thing to help identify which peptide you should inject, is you can actually isolate from patient populations uh, particular peptides. And you can identify those that ideally are exclusively expressed by the tumor and not expressed by normal tissues. That's a perfect target. Now, this is really the sign that your tumor is holding up saying, kill me. So you don't want a normal cell to be holding up a sign to the T cells saying, kill me. Okay, so this is the ideally that you want them to be exclusively expressed. Uh, so this was one of the thoughts. Well, maybe we just weren't using the right peptides. We have better experimental methods to isolate peptides from patients, be reasonably confident that they're specific for the tumor. So that might help. And of course, the second thing was, well, we also need to inject some other agents that help the dendritic cells do what they should do. And as I mentioned, you typically inject, uh, in the case of these vaccines, we inject into the dermis. And really, the target of what we're injecting is the dendritic cell, the dermal dendritic cell. We want it to take up these antigens. Actually, we want the peptides to bind and stay bound to MHC class 1. And we want the other pharmacological agents to engage specific receptors on the dendritic cells to basically give them their marching orders. So they head off to the lymph node and they present effectively the antigen that's bound. And you typically would inject into the dermis. So let's kind of step back and, and step through now the, the pr presumed mechanism of action. So here's the dermis, here are the dendritic cells. We inject some peptides um, with some typically monoclonal antibodies. And the first thing we can think about in terms of understanding where there might be some potential drivers of variability of response is just the whole, if you like, dispersion of these agents in the skin. How far do they disperse around the injection site? How many dendritic cells will you reach? Because probably one of the main drivers is the likelihood of driving T cell response, or to at least have a chance of driving a T cell response, is how many dendritic cells march to the, to the lymph node saying to the T cells, please, we need help. The second thing is probably how much antigen and for how long the dendritic cells are presenting that. So the first thing, of course, is to think about, well, how many cells can we reach? And then, of course, the second thing is we want these peptides to bind. And then, of course, we want them to march off, step three, to the lymph node, where they can then activate a population of T cells. Those T cells will then traffic, ideally infiltrate the tumor microenvironment, and then mediate uh, tumor-based killing, both of the primary as well as of metastatic lesions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to step you through our approach for how we thought about each of these elements. And again, our goal is to understand the likely determinants or drivers of variability of response. So let's start with this dispersion around the injection side. And this was relevant to us because we felt we actually had to give the elements separately. Injections have to be given separately to the, the, the peptides from the other agents. So this gives you a little bit of freedom. Should you give the injections at the same time? Should you give them in exactly the same site? Should you spatially separate the injections out in some way? Of course, our first thinking was, well, if we can understand the dispersion of the different elements, what's really key is the area across which all our agents are at pharmacologically active concentrations, because that will determine how many dendritic cells we can reach. If we've got a fixed density of cells, obviously that varies between subjects, and that can be an important source of variability. Um, but, but our interest was calculating this area. And the idea was, well, you know, if these are the peptides, maybe they spread really widely but they're cleared quite rapidly. And these larger molecules that, that are designed to give the dendritic cells their marching orders tend to diffuse more slowly. Maybe they don't diffuse as widely. We weren't too sure. But the idea would be um, if, for example, the larger molecules don't diffuse as widely as the peptides, um, the area um, 
of spread of the larger molecule would be limiting for the number of dendritic cells we could reach. Of course, if that weren't the case, um, or if that were the case, we might be able to do something like that. And now we've increased the area by a factor of four across which all of our elements are present at pharmacologically active concentrations. And in principle, we've quadrupled the number of dendritic cells that we can reach. And we believed that that was going to be an important driver of response. And when it comes to understanding dispersion in skin, there's some, some interesting experimental methods. So you can actually fluorescently label uh, monoclonal antibodies. You can fluorescently label other molecules. You can inject them in human subjects. And using video microscopy, you can watch in real time dispersion. And what we know from this is following initial injection, um, there's typically about a 10 minute rapid phase of dispersion. And that's driven by simply the increase in interstitial fluid pressure driven by the injection. And thereafter, you have a slower dispersion. And that dispersion can be well described by a mixture of diffusive spread and clearance. For larger molecules, they're cleared from the skin lymphatically. For smaller molecules, such as these peptides, they're cleared hematologically. So our interest was, well, how rapidly are these different elements cleared? So what we did is, is we basically built uh, a description of diffusion of each of the elements around the injection site. And as I mentioned, there are two key areas, uh, two, two key factors, skin clearance rates and rates of diffusion. Um, there were some uh, data that we could use to actually estimate that. So this is the rate of clearance of various molecules, proteins of different sizes, when injected intradermally versus subcutaneously. This is an indirect estimate of, of clearance. So PTH is, is probably the best analog in terms of molecular size. It's around the size of these peptides. They're all around 1,000 Daltons. And actually, if you look at that number, that translates into a half-life of only about four minutes. So when you inject into the skin, into the dermis, these peptides are hematologically cleared within, with a half-life of about four or five minutes. Of course, the more peptide you put in, the longer it's around for. Um, this is also the, the, a measure of how rapidly uh, a molecule or a protein will move through the, through the skin uh, based on its molecular mass. So we can take that and we can do some modeling, which is what we did. And this is showing um, the injection site would be the very top of that column. And this is a, a, a couple of days. I'm not too sure how far close those. This is for the GMCSF nanomolar. And you know, what happens, you inject and you imagine you've got this just defined column. We assume it's circular. And, and from the fluorescence imaging, it's largely circular. And then what happens, this column gets sucked from below by clearance and then starts to spread out. So these two competing forces determine really how far these different injected elements will disperse in the skin. And what this is, is we can chop, we can just do a cross-section through this. And um, actually, it's, it's, it's quite symmetric. The, the, the dispersion is quite symmetric. So what I'm going to just show you now is a cross-section through this column, and we'll just look at that now. And what we basically learned, which was to our surprise, we didn't expect the peptides to be cleared that rapidly. We weren't experts in peptide clearance from the dermis. Uh, the larger molecules are largely cleared lymphatically, so they stay around for days, and actually they end up dispersing much more widely than the peptides do. And what we found with the peptides is the rate of hematological clearance is so high, there's very little time for the peptides to disperse. So what that means is the initial dispersion area is essentially limited because the peptides aren't going to spread out much more widely beyond their high enough concentrations to bind to an XC class 1. And, and this is really what this slide is about. This is showing um, peptide. This is this column I mentioned. You know, you can imagine a cross-section through the column. Uh, and this is about two hours post-injection. Your peptide concentration is reduced by several thousand-fold, whereas the larger molecule has a lot more time to, to spread out. Um, so this was the first insight. We realized, actually, that um, really you're limited by how, how widely you distribute your peptide with your injection. Of course, that can inform the protocol. Right? You can inject to spread as, as widely, more widely as you would like. So the diffusive spread is, is minimal due to this depot clearance, which is rapid. Um, I think I've mentioned all of those things. The other thing is, actually, from the fluorescence uh, studies, you can get some handle on um, depending on the volume you're injecting, how you inject, roughly what area will that initial dispersion be at the end of that 10 minutes. And for our well, particular, actually this wasn't our vaccine, this is someone else's vaccine, I can't talk about our own, 
um, that dispersion area was about 0.6 square centimeter. Remember the other slide, 600 to 800 thermal dendritic cells you know, per square millimeter. So we're reaching about 36,000 to 48,000 uh, dendritic cells. So that's the first part. That, that's kind of, um, and, and without mentioning too much, what we do know, of course, is hematological blood flow and lymphatic flow in the dermis is affected by temperature, exercise. So now we were thinking, well, actually, if we cool down the injection site, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those specific peptides, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, the story will unfold in exactly, yeah, that's dead on. Of course, some vaccines you actually use much larger elements. In some cases, you try and inject directly into the lymph node. There are different strategies. Most of the strategies, if you look at the commercial players, is to try and extend the half life of these smaller peptides. Um, I, I personally, um, I'm not a great fan of the short peptides, but others are. So, but, um, but at least we've kind of thought it through. And, and I'll, I'll show you that, 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 that that's dead on. This was just a sensitivity analysis. It's not that important. It basically says the peptides are gone very quickly. Um, you're down below 10 picomolar. This is the time it takes to get from our initial, we inject all the different peptides with the same concentration. Um, and this is just the time it would take to get down to really neg negligible levels of the peptide based on the assumed rate of hematological clearance. And as long as you're somewhere here, it, it really, everything we're saying holds. So the point is we don't need to get too messed up about whether you believe my number for hematological clearance. It really doesn't matter. And of course, patients will be on a spectrum. If they've just had been for a run around the block, if it's really warm, you know, the, you'll, be, um, you'll be on the, on the right side of this curve. And this is the theoretical upper limit. So um, the rate of average blood flow through the dermis limits the rate at which you can clear any, any molecule from, from the dermis. And so now let's move to the uh, actual binding of these peptides, which is the second stage. So we've injected them. We now want them to bind. And you can actually measure the rate of binding of these peptides, and various people have done it. And what you find is the rate of binding, the on rate, seems to be fairly independent of the sequence. So within this family of peptides that we've selected, the on rate will be about the same. The difference is actually uh, in the off rate. And there's actually some, some uh, interesting um, quantitative approaches for taking your short peptide sequence and estimating the off rate. Uh, and these are based on experimentally verified off rates, and they're reasonably good estimates. You know, they're not going to be exact, but they're, they're, they're reasonably good. So what we can do is we can assume an on rate of about 3 by 10 to the 4 molar per second for each of these nine sequences. We can actually predict their off rates. And what we were really kind of surprised about, but it was actually a, a blessing in terms of the quantitative work we had to do, is because we didn't really have to worry about dispersion of these elements, we could actually develop a non-spatial binding model. Right? So we want to now describe how these different elements, particularly the peptides, bind to the dendritic cells. And we thought we'd have to worry about, over time, the peptides spreading out, and we'd have to deal with that complexity, and it turned out we didn't. Uh, because remember, you really don't get much dispersion. So um, what we can do is we can build a very simple model. This says this is a, a dendritic cell in the dermis. This is uh, one of the peptides, and of course there are nine of them. And they can bind, and they all bind at the same on rate, K-bind. And then they come off with peptide-specific off rates. Of course, the injected peptide can just be cleared hematologically. Uh, and then what we find is typically after about six hours, um, you need to wait for about six hours, even when you've given uh, a, a particular agent such as GMCSF to tell the dendritic cells to march. It takes about six hours until they start leaving the dermis. And this is the uh, them. So we put a delay, and then after that, they leave the dermis and move into the lymphatic compartment. So that's the lymph and all the lymph organs. We don't distinguish at this point. Um, and, and these are the basic sequences, uh, and these are the estimated dissociation half-lives. Look at the wide variability there in terms of the dissociation half-lives. Tremendous.
Some of these peptides will only remain bound for two minutes, and this comes to your question earlier. There's some fundamental differences in the off rates, and these become important, uh, and you'll see why shortly. So what we can do is we, we assume about 100,000 MHC class 1 receptors for the dendritic cell. And what we can now do is express the concentration of these peptides with respect to MHC class 1 density, and that's what you can see here. But, uh, and these are the individual peptides. And look at this. And this, even before six hours, the peptides come off. So what this means is over time, of course, the level of antigen presentation is decreasing with time. The absolute level is going down because these peptides are coming off. And, of course, the higher affinity peptides stay on longer. So what that means over time is you bias presentation to the higher affinity peptides. And this is now um, a quick point. Um, the, actually, you can calculate the on rate from the initial concentration of the peptide and the on rate. And it's so rapid compared to that even very rapid, rapid rate of hematological clearance, we know that that clearance isn't limiting to binding, basically. Um, you can show that very, uh, in a very simple way. And this is now the profile uh, in, in the lymphatic system, so six-hour delay, remember we said. We know this will vary from patient to patient, and again, if someone's gone for a big run around the block and other things are, uh, are present, that will be a driver of variability in terms of um, patient uh, responses with respect to these measures. And then this is, uh, again, the two higher affinity peptides. Of course, in, in lymph, it looks different. It, it's not a mono... It, you don't have this simple decay. There's a delay. It comes up and then it comes down. But you have the same general pattern. And that pattern is the higher affinity peptides are overrepresented the longer you go. And actually, if you calculate fractional occupancy of MHC class 1, in the dermis versus in the lymph, it's not that different. It's very similar. But look at this. So this is fractional occupancy by each of those peptides, each of the nine. And what you see is um, even by six hours, you see basically um, more than half of them have essentially gone. So they can't drive a T-cell response. They're gone. And if you come out to 30 hours, of course, now you see there are only about three peptides left. And more than 90% of the presentation of antigen by these cells is dominated by two of the peptides, and those two that have pretty much equal affinities. So what we learned when we kind of went through that exercise, uh, in a sense, it, it should have been obvious to us, but it wasn't. And it was simply that there is a biased representation of the peptides over time. And the analogy is, think of the dendritic cell as a truck, and you're loading it up with six kinds of rocks. And different rocks are leaking out of the truck at different times, and you drive, you eventually get to your destination, you've lost a lot of your stuff. But the, the stuff that's leaking less rapidly, of course, is overrepresented in the back of the truck. And the longer you drive, the more biased that um, representation is. So the next question is, Okay, so what about now the dendritic cell maturation and migration? And of course, this is we're giving the GM uh, CSF to drive this. And but again, remember we said it doesn't matter that this is going to disperse more widely than the peptides. It's only the area that sees both the peptides and this activating agent that will actually be determining for the number of dendritic cells that can get to the lymph node. And we, as I mentioned, uh, they're activated on the time scale of hours. So if you inject, it's about six hours until these uh, cells start leaving. And you could say, well, why not inject this agent first and inject the peptides later? And you'll see later it's a more fundamental problem than that. So sure, you could stagger the injections temporally, but it doesn't really buy you too much at the end of the day. Um, the, mar the majority of the cells will leave from the injection area and, and around it, um, and we think it will take days for new cells to come in. So there's no point just waiting, uh, you know, injecting the next day or, or giving an injection in the morning and then maybe giving one at the end of the day. And of course, logistically, that's not really feasible either. The real constraints on, on clinical trial designs. Uh, this is actually some mouse data. This is quantum dot labeled dendritic cells. Um, so I should have given the paper reference here. If any of you are interested, I can send you the, the reference. And, and what they've done is they've injected into the foot pad of mice uh, labeled dendritic cells, and then you just uh, you also inject some things to help them, give them their marching orders, and this is their rate of appearance in the popliteal node. Um, 
And what you can see is none of the cells are there within six hours. They start arriving at 12 hours by 24. It's, it's really on the move. And, and what we know, of course, and, but look at this. The percentage of the injected cells that get there, 4% at most, less than 10%. So nine, of, nine out of those ten dendritic cells have gone somewhere else. So they're not going to help you. And what can we know uh, in humans? We can actually label dendritic cells in humans. And this is from a Dutch group. And this is showing the 24-hour percentage migration. So it's actually uh, remarkably inefficient. So the migration efficiency is about 1%. So we expect the same thing to apply when we actually inject and, uh, you know, we vaccine. Of those dendritic cells we'll reach, we expect only about 1% or so to, to actually make it to the, the lymph node. But look at this variability. Tremendous variability in terms of migrational efficiency across a patient population. So we said, oh, this is also an interesting uh, biological determinant of response because it's going to affect how many of your cells get to the lymph node and somehow we had this feeling that the number of lymph nodes and the level of antigen presentation was going to be important. And that brings us to the whole question of priming and activation. But if we just step back, so we inject, we wait six hours, we probably need another 12 to 18 hours for the cells to start occurring in the lymph node. And then how long do they need to be in the lymph node? have a reasonable chance of finding that one in a million T cell. So these two cells have to find each other, they have to make physical contact, and that's the basis of priming activation. So, um, and, and this is really where the action happens. This is kind of uh, the dendritic cells come in and they end up in what's called this central um, deep cortical unit. This is really where the T cells have the highest probability of, of meeting and touching these dendritic cells. So we're interested in understanding that uh, in a little bit more detail. I, I apologize for the slides. We just uh, swapped between computers, and I just see we got one formatting change, but that's uh, minor. And this is a, a fairly recent um, uh, paper, just looking at the question of how many dendritic cells are actually required to drive a T cell response. And what they've done here, it's a mouse model. They've injected fluorescently labeled dendritic cells. They've injected CD4 cells specific for a particular antigen, and then they've injected that antigen. So what they've done is they've just uh, stacked the odds in their favor, right? Because every single antigen being presented is the same antigen, and all the CD4 cells will recognize that antigen. And what you can do is, I, I, sh I should have brought a movie. I don't know if any of you have seen the two-photo microscopy. It's really cool. You see these cells running around, and you can actually quantitate their average velocity and the likelihood they find each other. And this is um, actually just a, an example of one of the simulation runs. So the green circles are dendritic cells. So you model the, the, the lymph node section as a sphere. And these paths are T cells. In, in their case, they're assumed to move by Browning motion. And what you can now do is you can say, if these two cells find each other, come within contact radius of each other, that will drive activation. And you can actually, um, based on a model built from the data, you can actually begin to understand the probability of an encounter, which we assume in this setting is the probability of T-cell activation, uh, as a function of the number of dendritic cells at various times, 6 hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours. And they came to the conclusion that actually you probably need at least 80 or so dendritic cells, because if you have fewer than that, they're the, the, den the dendritic cell will die for about two days. So once it gets to the lymph node, it stays in the lymph node for about two days. So if you don't have enough of those dendritic cells present, there simply isn't enough time for them to find that rare partner, the one in a million T cell, that will recognize whatever antigen they're presenting. So we thought, well, we now know we need at least probably 80 or so, 85 dendritic cells. Um, and we also we need a certain amount of time. And that time is going to depend on the number of dendritic cells, but to have, say, an 80% chance of driving a response uh, within, say, 24 hours, you know, you need to have at least 200. Okay. These were CD4 cells. What we did is we assumed this applied to CD8 cells. We know the velocity of motion of the CD8 cells is a little bit different. We actually build our own models and, and, and change some assumptions here. Uh, here they just assume all the dendritic cells are there from time one. What we do is we actually let the dendritic cells come in over time, which is actually physiologically what happens. And then we also let the antigen come off over time. 
So now we can begin to put this all together. Um, so we can say the chance for a T cell residing 24 hours, this is in the mouse lymph mode, uh, to interact with the dendritic cell, I say 8, 58, or 99% when you've got 10, 100, or 1,000 antigen presenting cells. So now we can start to put all of these different pieces together. And as I mentioned, um, we call this a precursor. And the precursor, the idea of the precursor is just a precursor frequency is the percentage or fraction of your T cells that you believe have the ability to recognize your antigen of interest. That their T cell receptor, the receptor, special receptor they have, can actually see bind to MHC class 1 with high enough affinity that when the two cells find each other and kiss each other, that that will be a productive interaction. Okay, so, and typically we assume for a first primary response that, that the T cell frequency is one in a million. And now what we can begin to say is, well, actually, let's take our calculation, 36,000 to 48,000. Let's just assume a distribution of migrational efficiencies as we saw before. And what you calculate is actually there's probably about 22% or so of patients based on the distribution of that limited human data that will not respond at all. And the major driver of their non-response is you haven't been able to get enough dendritic cells from the vaccination site to the draining lymph node. So that was the first uh, element. And then, of course, the second thing is um, the patients are unlikely to respond to those lower affinity peptides. So remember we said there are only two, three peptides that seem to be around at 30 hours. Remember that fractional occupancy? Well, you've got to be there for at least 30 hours to have any chance of driving a response. So what we now know is, and, and, and the problem in our own clinical trial design and many of these designs, is we've got this mixture of peptides that's being collected from multiple patients, and we don't know which specific patient is expressing which particular peptide. So if you're expressing a low affinity peptide, you're going to get no benefit. Right? There's just no chance of you driving a T-cell response. And, and, and actually, what was interesting, um, for this particular peptide um, in a phase one study, in, in some of the early clinical studies, they actually immunomonitored the patient. So all that means is you take blood from them after vaccination, and you see whether any of the T-cells in that blood sample uh, are specific for the peptides that you've put in. There's a simple assay where you can determine that. And, and what they did, which was really interesting, of their 27 patients, they found only 20 patients responded. So, uh, sorry, um, 20 patients. So, 74% response, where response is simply defined as you see a T cell response in the peripheral blood. What was really interesting is they didn't see a response to any more than three peptides. In the majority of the patients who responded, you only see a response to one or two peptides. And in fact, their non-response rate was pretty close to the back of the envelope calculation we had. And we believe that those non-responders aren't responding simply because uh, we're not getting enough dendritic cells uh, from the vaccination site. And we think the other patients aren't responding um, because um, when you inject the patient population, uh, in this case with renal cell carcinoma, many of those patients will be expressing only the low affinity peptide. So sure, you might drive a T cell response, but it's futile. Uh, you've driven it in the periphery, but it's not going to help them clear their tumor. So just to kind of put it all together and, and wrap up, I think our conclusions were, were pretty clear. Um, the first is that any evoked T cell response would be biased in favor of the higher affinity peptides. So if you want to go ahead with the vaccination strategy, you should enrich your patient population with respect to those high affinity peptides and your vaccination mixture. These are actually expensive peptides to make, so why inject nine when only two or three of them will be helpful? But again, the problem is we don't know which patients are presenting those antigens. So, um, so you'd need some way of uh, a priori enriching your patient population to know that they're actually expressing these uh, peptides. So it needs to be personalized in some way, and that takes time and can be expensive. So from our point of view as a company, we, we really didn't want to go in that direction, and, and we've really moved away completely from s small peptide vaccines. Um, the other thing is, of course, I remember I mentioned this idea of spatially separating the injections. Well, we can get more dendritic cells by simply spatially separating the injection. So we're suggesting at least three separate sites, um, and in that way, you can triple the number of dendritic cells, and you'll push some of those non-responders to responders because 
they're not responding simply because you weren't pushing enough dendritic cells um, through to the lymph node. And uh, just based on the distribution we calculated, um, there's still some patients that won't respond. For whatever reason, they might, the migrational efficiencies are just so low in those patients, there's nothing you can do to, to push them through. Um, the next thing is the vaccination injection technique. We, we began to realize, actually, if you look at um, um, the rate of clearance at least of these peptides, um, there's dramatic interpatient variability, and it's basically driven by differences in dermal blood flow. So standardize, you know, cool down the arms, don't let them run around the ward, let them sit there for a time period. And also, there's quite a lot of, I don't know if any of you have done intradermal injections, they're quite hard, they're a little, and, and so you really need to train people so that you, you, you get comparable dispersion areas across the patient population. If you don't, you'll get um, variability in the response simply due to the fact that someone's injected in a way where they've got twice the dispersion area. And from a clinical trial point of view, we like to minimize and control all the relevant drivers of variability in the response. So that was another thing we wanted to actually improve training uh, of um, the people at the sites. And then, of course, the last point is the alternative, alternative delivery um, uh, mechanism should be explored. And that's the way the whole field is going, injecting straight into the lymph node. Um, obviously, engineering uh, dendritic cells, that's the, the only approved vaccine is basically uh, an en engineered dendritic cell that will present the right antigen. So I hope that was interesting and uh, open the floor for discussion, questions. Yeah. Um, the idea of injecting to the dermis. Yeah.